Who will be the next president of France? Emmanuel Macron bids for re-election in the shadow of war in Ukraine. But candidates from the far right and far left say he's out of touch with the French population. Will the voters prove them right? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohamed Jamjoum. Five years ago, Emmanuel Macron was a newcomer to French politics. He swept aside the traditional left-right political divide by forming a centrist party and becoming the youngest ever president. Now, the 44-year-old is the incumbent seeking re-election. Sunday's first round of voting is happening in the shadow of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Macron held his only campaign rally last Saturday outside Paris. He promised to defend Europe's democracy while raising pensions and cutting corporate taxes. Opinion polls suggest a repeat of 2017 when Macron faced Marine Le Pen in the second round. The far-right candidate has since toned down her previous statements against immigration. Instead, she's focused her campaign on the high cost of living. Both are facing late challenge from the far left. We'll bring in our guests in a moment. First, Natasha Butler reports from Lille. Jean-Luc Mélenchon is one of France's best-known politicians, a fiery orator and former Trotskyist. The far-left party leader has spent years on the margins of French politics, but Mélenchon's fortunes are changing. Opinion polls suggest he could make it to the second round of the presidential election. At a rally in Lille, he said if elected, he'd end inequality, fight climate change and tackle the cost-of-living crisis. Millions of French people are being strangled by the rising cost of living and fuel prices. Millions of French people. So the role of those who lead the nation is to fix this. Mélenchon's supporters say he's the antithesis of Emmanuel Macron, who Mélenchon once nicknamed the president of the rich. It's been a difficult five years for many people, so as far as I'm concerned, we can't re-elect Emmanuel Macron. Mélenchon embodies anti-capitalism, pro-workers' rights. We're sick of factories shutting in France. We want a strong Europe. And Mélenchon's the only one with answers. One of the main reasons that Mélenchon is doing so well in this presidential election is because France's traditional left-wing socialist party is doing badly. For decades, the Socialist Party was a political force that created presidents. But the arrival of the centrist Macron in 2017 and a shift among voters to the political right has left the Socialist Party in tatters and its presidential candidate Anne Hidalgo floundering in the polls. The Socialist Party still has local uh, mayors, but on the national level it has lost any appeal because it's lost a program. It's lost ideas. It's lost the battle of ideas. And, and François Hollande's presidency is seen in its legacy as a, a moment of weakness uh, in terms of ideas, in terms of proposals, in terms of also answers to the problems of globalization, of uh, uh, the changes uh, in the society. With most parties on the left, including the Greens, trailing in the polls, Mélenchon is expected to reap the majority of left-wing votes. Few people expect him to win the presidency, but making it past the first round could signal that France's left is ready for a revival. Natasha Butler, Al Jazeera, Lille. All right, let's go ahead and bring in our guests. In Paris, Hamid Shriet, a political commentator and researcher on French economic affairs. In Saint-Malo, Jacques Relan, a senior research fellow at the Global Policy Institute and a specialist in economic and social policy. Also in Paris, Jazine Weber, a program coordinator with the German Marshall Fund of the U.S. Paris office and an expert in European security issues. A warm welcome to you all, and thanks for joining us today on Inside Story. Jacques, let me start with you today. Where do things stand in the election right now? Uh, opinion polls are suggesting a repeat of 2017 when President Macron faced Marine Le Pen in the second round. Do you think that's what we're going to see happen? It looks like it. Yeah, at this stage, it looks like it. Uh, Macron 
was well in the lead uh, when the war started at 32%. Now it's down to 26, 27%. But uh, Marine Le Pen, who has risen from uh, 17 to 22 in that space. And the only other contender could be Jean-Luc Mélenchon, uh, who last time rose quite uh, five points in the last week. He's now at 15, around 15, 16 but I don't think he will be able to overtake Marine Le Pen. So it looks like uh, uh, Macron-Le Pen uh, duel uh, for the second round, but with a closer margin, a uh, narrower margin than was expected uh, about only even two weeks ago. So that's the main point is the rise and rise of Marine Le Pen in the last couple of weeks and uh, can explain why that has happened mm. at a later stage. But if you want, I can, uh, I can start now. I yeah, no, I'll, I'll, too uh, long. Uh, Jacques, I'll, I'll actually get back to you with a question on that in just a moment. Um, Jazine, let me ask you, how much has Russia's invasion of Ukraine upended President Macron's plans for what he had hoped to accomplish in the first half of this year? And how, how much is the shadow of the conflict in Ukraine looming over this election cycle? So maybe I will start uh, with the first question. Thank you very much for that. So um, in this context, it is very important to know that France is currently holding um, the rotating presidency of uh, the Council of the European Union. And when you are holding this function or when you have this role, that means that you have kind of a coordinating role and can give um, some ideas for what can be done on the European level. And um, when Macron presented this program in December, it was clear that he wanted to put the focus um, on everything related to European sovereignty, but also um, to uh, economic recovery, as well as um, creating a feeling of belonging to Europe. And with the Ukraine crisis, in terms of foreign policy, it was particularly um, the part on sovereignty that is becoming more and more important. So as you might know, um, since his Sorbonne speech in 2017, Macron has always pitched the idea of European strategic autonomy, um, lately changed the wording to sovereignty. But the idea of this is basically that the EU itself is able to make its independent decisions based on its interests and, of course, where possible, in cooperation with partners. And over quite a long time, fellow Europeans were kind of, kind of wary of this concept, mm -hmm. thought that uh, it's kind of a hyperactivism of Macron. But then, when the war in Ukraine kicked in, um, other Europeans painfully realized that this idea of having a Europe that is kind of a bit more sovereign in mm -hmm. terms of energy supply and in defense and can really leverage its his tools, um, yeah, that this is maybe not the worst idea. And mm -hmm. when we saw what Europe has done, that is basically putting Macron's concept of sovereignty mm -hmm. into practice. So, of course, it was not only him who has achieved that, but, um, yeah, that's a clear success. Also knowing that Macron is the only channel of communication that Europe still has um, mm -hmm. for Russia. I leave it here um, if you want to ask a follow up. Question. No, I'll, I'll get I'll get back to you on that point, actually, in a moment, too. Um, Hamid, let me ask you from your vantage point um, how the electorate is responding to what's going on in Ukraine. I mentioned this because, uh, you know, uh, President Macron has been heavily involved in trying to broker some type of diplomatic solution to the crisis in Ukraine. Um, he has been reaching out repeatedly to uh, Russian President Putin. Uh, he's been shuttling around, uh, trying to come up with some type of solution. Is that something that, that's hurting him or helping him when it comes to voters and when it comes to this election? When it comes to the voters at the beginning of the Ukrainian crisis, Macron uh, has benefits, of course, uh, uh, during his election. But at the end of the day, uh, the French voters uh, will see uh, uh, if their uh, salaries have increased or not. I think this is the main important point. Uh, we've seen uh, empty presidency of the European Union, and we've seen as well the domination of the American uh, leadership Biden in the, the European Parliament. So uh, French people are very uh, uh, have been doubted by the presidency of Macron, and uh, during uh, his uh, last five uh, 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 reigns of uh, the, the French presidency. So I, I believe that the uh, the uh, French people. Uh, uh, will not, of course, uh, 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 support uh, this war about the Russian invasion. But, the end of, but the, at the end of the day, 
they are very worried about the social uh, 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 about the social situation and the economic situation. Mm-hmm. They are suffering uh, in France. We've never seen in France people. Uh, I've never seen personally in France people are going uh, uh, to bring uh, food from the bean in France in Paris. So I live in the popular area, uh, which is 19 uh, 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 arrondissement in France, mm-hmm. and the the, the 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 economic and social situation is worse than before. Um, Jacques, I want to pick up on a point you were starting to make in your last answer, which is um, the reasons for the sudden surge in the polls for Marine uh, Le Pen. Uh, so I want to ask you, first of all, um, what are some of the reasons for that? And, and, and secondly, the fact that Marine Le Pen has softened some of her rhetoric around topics like Islam and like Euroscepticism, is that something that is helping her right now to, to win potential voters outside of her typical solid base. Yes, indeed. I mean, the thing is that, as uh, Amit was mentioning, the people at first were very concerned about the war, and um, Marine Le Pen lost some points because she's so pro-Putin. She's a great Putin supporter, has even reiterated recently that the best life of France would be Russia. But uh, the fact is that people are now more concerned about the consequences of the war than the war, and the consequences on the cost of living. And the cost of living has been the hobby horse of Marine Le Pen in the last few months. She's campaigned on that. She has, uh, uh, she did not highlight her positions on race and things. She suffered her image and concentrated on the cost for people who find it hard to make ends meet. And she has a lot of support among the working classes, unlike uh, Eric Zemmour, for example. Uh, a lot of ex communist voters, we can see the working areas, the working parts of France, like the north of France, she's very popular there. And also, she made a very good campaign, no big meetings. Uh, she traveled, stayed close to the people. And one factor which is very important, Mm -hmm. is that Eric Zemmour, with his radical positions, has made her look soft, look coldly. She has a better image now. People, like 46% of the French people, think that that she understands people like them. It used to be 22% in 2017. And now she's developed an image, the image of the woman next door who will look after, will be very helpful and look after your cats when you're away. Mm-hmm. And she's actually made a big of the fact that she's she loves cats. She's become a cat a cat breeder. So she has a much softer image. But at the same time, and that's my main concern, is that her policies, uh, on which she has not been challenged much by the media and she has not taken part in many debates, her mm-hmm. policies are still hard. I think that. Uh, uh, Marine Le Pen is a wolf in sheep's clothing. Mm. And we can talk about the policies on immigration and Europe Mm -hmm. and on the economy. They would be damaging uh, for France, uh, for France's economy Mm -hmm. and for France's standing in Europe. I think it would be a victory of Marine Le Pen would be would it be more damaging even right. to the European Union that brings it. Uh, Jazine, um, you heard Jacques there talk about uh, the opinion he was expressing was that a Le Pen presidency would be damaging um, for uh, France's standing in Europe. I, I want to ask you, what would a Le Pen presidency mean for Europe? Well, a Le Pen presidency would be very bad news for Europe. That is for sure. Um, maybe to start from a bit like an integration and institutional perspective, um, Le Pen has or had until um, the Brexit referendum actually always um, lobbied for a Brexit and underlined that this would be a good idea, but her narrative has changed. I mean, in fact, what she's advocating for now is kind of leaving the EU but staying inside because she says that she wants um, to reinstall the primacy of French and national law over EU law. So basically EU law would not even or would not anymore be applied in EU members or in France, which basically means you're just in a loose grouping um, of states that doesn't have any uh, regulatory power. And that is also what makes um, the core of uh, the European Union. Mm-hmm. From a bit, from a broad, broader perspective, um, this uh, Le Pen victory would be very bad news for Europe because any deeper integration project 
would immediately um, be ended or would just not be pursued, and particularly um, in the foreign and security policy. That would be extremely complicated because mm -hmm. um, you always need unanimity among member states to pursue projects here. So um, if there is a French veto on anything, Mm -hmm. um, the recent geopolitical awakening of the EU that we have just seen would have been a short momentum that um, would unfortunately only make it to history books. Uh, Hamid, um, Eric Zemmour, uh, sorry, Hamid, I want to ask you something about first, something that Jacques was mentioning. Uh, he was saying that uh, the candidacy of Eric Zemmour uh, essentially makes Marine Le Pen look more relatable or perhaps more palatable uh, to voters. I, I want to ask you uh, about that. You know, Eric Zemmour is somebody who's twice been convicted for inciting uh, racial or religious hatred. The fact that he is running, does that, is that something that's normalized Marine Le Pen uh, for, for other voters? Is that something that, that has made her perhaps more palatable to other voters? Yeah, exactly. That is true. Uh, I do agree with Jack. Uh, uh, she, uh, she was normalized, of course, by the Eric Zemmour, the candidate, because uh, he was more extremist of, uh, of her. Uh, so I believe that Eric Zemmour, uh, uh, she was uh, at the beginning of the, the campaign, uh, criticizing the, the posture of Eric Zemmour, uh, saying that uh, he is a, a racist guy, Islamophobe guy. Uh, she uh, changed her uh, speech about the integration of the French Muslim people. Uh, we know, everybody knows uh, how uh, Eric Zemmour criticized uh, Islam and non Islamism. Uh, he was saying uh, Zemmour, that the French uh, Muslim people has to leave uh, the faith and the religion. But uh, I would like to uh, come back to the point about the, uh, the Marie Le Pen and, and uh, Macron. Uh, don't forget that Emmanuel Macron and Marie Le Pen have the same economic program. Uh, she's a liberal and he is a liberal. The only candidate who uh, really proposed a social reform is Johnny Comenochon, who wants to, of course, increase uh, the minimum uh, salaries for the French people. And uh, he knows how uh, French people during uh, uh, the uh, Macron's presidency have been uh, suffering. Uh, considerably, uh, I would like as well to uh, to 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 uh, reach uh, to raise sorry an important point about the yellow vest movement. Uh, the the ideology of the yellow vest movement in France is still there, is still in the soul and in the heart of the French people in France. Uh, I think uh, the crisis is more is a deeper than uh, than the, 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 the French election. Uh, uh, there is in France. Uh, in a democratic crisis, mm -hmm. which will have to be uh, resolved uh, today. The, f the fifth uh, regime of the Republic is now uh, finished. And that's why uh, the, 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 democratic, the, the, cri the democratic crisis mm -hmm. is, uh, has to be resolved in France. Jacques, um, Hamid just mentioned uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon. And we heard in Natasha Butler's report earlier in the program uh, that perhaps his political fortunes may be changing now. Do you think that is the case? And could he potentially make it to the second round as a candidate? I think it's a bit difficult. Last time, he was very close to uh, Marine Le Pen coming in third position. But uh, last time, there were no green candidate and no communist candidate. And they've been eating it to, uh, and they have voters of, of uh, representing about seven, uh, well, seven, eight percent, you don't know exactly. And obviously, if they decided to uh, vote for Jean-Luc Mélenchon, Jean-Luc Mélenchon would have a chance to come second, but I doubt it. I would like to come back on the point of uh, Amid, and it is the climate in France at the mm -hmm. moment, is that there is a kind of a democratic weariness, I would say. People say, OK, we have elections, but things don't change. It's always more or less the same thing. Yeah, it's true. We are part of the European Union, a free liberal market, etc. And governments can't do too much because of the international constraints. So there's a desire on the part of people to overthrow the table, to kick the thing. It's a bit like the feeling there was at the time of Brexit in Britain, where mm -hmm. people needed a scapegoat. And uh, at the moment, it seemed that maybe the scapegoat could be Emmanuel Macron himself, even though, uh, contrary to what Amit said, he's not. He hasn't got the same policies as uh, Marine Le Pen, and he's not a neoliberal. He is 
social liberal, advocates the social market economy, but uh, is not a neoliberal. And we can see in his uh, last meeting, mm -hmm. you know that somebody went too far on the right by saying pensions should rise to 65 mm -hmm. and people getting supplementary benefits should have some kind of involvement in the world of work and training, not obligatory work, but training. But at the same time, he's made sure that he realizes that if he is to win, he has to earn votes on the left. Uh -huh. So he's, he's taken some more social measures, such as raising uh, the minimum pension and so on. Quite a, a few measures go uh, towards helping. And if you look at his record, you realize mm -hmm. that uh, the French are not doing too badly compared to the other. The energy prices in France have risen by 4%. In the rest of the EU, it's 29%. In Britain, they're right. present by 54%. But the French always like to think that, uh, you know, it's terrible, unequal. We are one of the most least unequal countries Jacques, uh, in the EU. I'm sorry, and, I, uh, Jacques, I'm sorry to interrupt you. It's just we are starting to, to run out of time. I, I do want to ask Jazine another question here. Um, Jazine, you, you wrote a piece recently in which you said, and I'm going to quote it, Macron is the most Europhile president that France has perhaps ever seen. And the quest for European strategic autonomy has characterized his foreign policy over the last five years. I know that you were talking about some aspects of this uh, in an earlier answer, but how much has uh, President Macron transformed the EU? Well, um, my, I would say if you had asked that question to me in 2019 or before the COVID crisis, I would say not really because um, the call for European strategic autonomy didn't resonate in his, in his uh, first years of presidency, but that completely changed um, with COVID and the recovery plan, when Europeans basically um, discovered that they are completely dependent on supply chains and need to step up their own capacities and capabilities um, to deal with uh, these challenges. And also what I think um, from a foreign policy and defense policy perspective is particularly interesting is that um, his narrative of European strategic autonomy and um, strengthening European sovereignty has now made it into the language of the institutions. So Ursula von der Leyen, the commission president, Charles Michel, president um, of the council, they are all using this word learning. And that basically shows that there is kind of a change in thinking on how the EU approaches global, global challenges. And also when you're looking at um, what was achieved um, in terms of new defense initiatives, for example, mm -hmm. I would say Macron's track record is quite good. So um, for example, we now have a new uh, rapid uh, deployment force in the strategic compass. The strategic compass mm -hmm. is a document which is kind of a strategic guideline that was just adopted in the end of March. Mm -hmm. And that is deeply characterized also by um, French influence. So uh, I would say he has transformed the EU in terms of methods um, and also has given an important impetus to the EU um, to see itself and to start understanding itself as a mm -hmm. geopolitical actor. But uh, it ha he has also transformed Europe because Europeans are now working differently together, right. not only in the EU, but also in coalitions of the willing. Uh, Hamid, uh, we only have about a minute and a half left. I, I just want to ask you about the fact that President Macron, uh, you know, he really swept aside the traditional left-right political divide when it comes to uh, French politics by forming this centrist party. Is that something that has completely remade uh, French politics? Well, I think Macron is out of touch. Uh, we've seen his old policies uh, in France during the, 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 his uh, presidency. But I believe that the, the absenteeism in France, it's very important today. More than 60% of the French people maybe will not vote. Uh, people have been deceived by the presidency of Emmanuel Macron. And this is, will, of course, increase the democratic crisis in France. And uh, I'm very worried about the political situation in the political map in France. Uh, this is, is a, I mean, a, a huge uh, worrying for uh, the French elites. And if we, if Emmanuel Macron will not take seriously uh, the social problems in France and resolve the uh, protestation mm -hmm. of the yellow vest in France, uh, this is will be, of course, his presidency. His presidency, sorry, will be a disaster for the French economy, mm -hmm. and uh, the the political situation will be unstable. 
All right. And well, this we... will, of course, destabilize the whole European Union. All right. Well, uh, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thank you so much to all of our guests, Hamid Shriet, Jacine Weber, and Jacques Relan. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here in Doha, bye for now.